So it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to the current president of Jeff Waddington, uh, current president of IMS even, Jeff Waddington. It's been a long day, Jeff. Um, of course, you are one of three people who are responsible for me sitting here. You were on the interview panel seven years ago. That's how long I've known you now. And uh, decided that I was the man for this job. And it's been a great partnership. Um, you're doing a great job as president. I have to say that because you paid me five pounds earlier to say, no, seriously, Jeff, you're doing a wonderful job as president. And uh, when I invited Jeff to do this, again, this is a, a concept that I picked up in America uh, with James Rain earlier this year when a surveyor simply came up with a load of photos and talked through some of the crazy things that you see. And I would suggest that that photo there on the left is a pretty crazy photo of what you might see on survey. So I encourage Jeff to empty the contents of his um, photo library. Uh, he's got 100 photos and um, he's going to talk you through them. Um, so you've got about an hour, Jeff, and good luck. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you, Mike. And, and, uh, and welcome to all those uh, watching. I think we've got quite an audience here. And I think some of you guys uh, probably deserve a medal for sitting through the whole day, but I hope it's all been entertaining for you. But uh, this is a bit of a, a, a bit lighthearted. Um, I'm going to try not to name names or, or point fingers, but uh, there's some pretty interesting stuff in amongst these photos. Um, I've, I've tried to limit... <laughs> My, my library of nightmares. Um, but there's some thought provoking pictures here, which I think uh, uh, you might find interesting as we go along. Yeah. So if you're all ready, we'll, uh, we'll start at the beginning. So uh, hold below the waterline. Okay, this, this particular shot uh, is a vessel that was being built uh, ashore in Portugal. Uh, and it was being built to a, um, a design from a well-known designer. Uh, and the guy was making, it's an 85 foot motor yacht. Uh, and he built the whole thing from scratch. So uh, he laminated the whole uh, in sections on a table uh, and then glassed the sections together to form the whole um, and although he professed to be uh, a well-disciplined um, and knowledgeable boat builder, um, he asked me to come along on behalf of insurers uh, to see what he'd managed to achieve. Well, um, as you can see, uh, it's sitting in a cradle, but the keel line is not quite straight. Um, so this was a bit of a clue that, that things haven't gone quite according to plan. Uh, when uh, I removed some of the paint, I found that maybe his laminating wasn't quite up to scratch either. So uh, <laughs> this shows the fact that the, the boat in, in certain areas, uh, in fact a lot of areas, there was actually dry laminate with no resin whatsoever. Even where there was resin, um, there wasn't a lot of it. So you can still see all the fibers in this one. And here, well, we have got some resin, but again, we've still got the fibers, uh, dry fibers visible underneath. <clears throat> the outcome of this was that he was gonna launch the boat and, and he wanted to undertake some large ocean going trips in it. Um, I had to advise him uh, in one instance not to launch the boat um, without carrying out an awful lot of repair work to the hull. Um, he was very disappointed about this um, and, and less than complimentary um, to my decision. Uh, and anyway, he went away and, and he launched the boat uh, irrespective um, and it remained afloat for a little while before it started to sink. Uh, the boat now, I believe, is back out ashore, um, and I think he lives on the boat, but I don't think he's going to live on the boat in the water. <laughs> <clears throat> this one here, um, another whole issue. This really, um, well, well, we'll go through the story, really. This is a brand new boat. 
that was in the Dusseldorf Boat Show. Um, on the way back from the Dusseldorf Boat Show, um, something happened to the hull. When the boat was lifted back out of the water here in the UK by the manufacturer, this is what they found. So the decision on the manufacturer was that the boat had obviously struck an object and suffered some damage. Uh, this is the area of damage. Um, so I pointed out to the manufacturer that it couldn't have struck an object because if it had done um, the object, whatever it had hit would have written off the stern gear. So unless the boat has dropped vertically onto something and then lifted immediately vertically off it, um, there was no hope of actually having the impact damage to the outer hull. The investigations carried on and I had a look on, on inside the boat and found that there were cracks to the stiffening inside. So obviously the boat had suffered some trauma. Um, and then I noticed some burn marks on the hull uh, where they'd welded a frame where the hull had been supported uh, in the Dusseldorf show. Uh, and it looked as though the vast majority, certainly from midships, um, the, the boat was unsupported. So all of the weight was being concentrated in the midship section. I suppose it looked dramatic to have um, 30 odd feet of boat sticking out um, for people to look at, but uh, the reality was that they, they, they were causing um, a lot of damage to the hull. Eventually this had resulted in a crack in the hull um, and then on the return journey, the water found its way into that crack and eventually peeled off the outer laminate. The reason the outer laminate peeled off so well was um, because it hadn't been properly constructed because the boat was actually one of the first of this model to be resin infused. And unfortunately, the resin infusion process had not gone according to plan. Needless to say, the delivery skipper who was being blamed for the incident um, was no longer blamed for the incident uh, and everything went very quiet uh, and the factory undertook the repairs to put the boat back to normal. So, uh, I mean, there's a brand new boat um, and it's, it's 75 feet long, so it's not a little boat. Uh, and you can imagine that, uh, that, that they were quite upset about that. But there we go, it was their fault. <clears throat> this uh, outer bottom uh, is, has been painted with a silicon-based antifoul. This was a picture of the boat as it was at time of survey. To be perfectly honest, you'd be, you'd have to be a pretty amazing surveyor to determine whether or not the underlying hull had any defects with a paint coating in this condition. Uh, and this was how it came to light in the end, because it was eventually found that the boat had a severe problem underneath here in the form of blistering. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to determine that uh, because of the poor state of the outer hull coatings, which somebody had obviously applied themselves. Um, well, I'm not sure how they applied it, but as I think you can see from that. So, where, the, where there were obvious signs of blistering, uh, this is what we found. Again, we've got dry laminate inside, uh, which has formed the blister. And when the paint was removed, um, you could see the extent of the blistering underneath. The lesson to be learned here is, um, and I hope the lesson that the surveyor learned, was that you need to remove paint in order to determine what the condition of the underlying hull is. You can't remove all of the paint. Therefore, if you can't determine the state of the hull, then you should recommend that all of the paint is removed. Because unless you do so, you'll never know what the underlying problems are. Uh, and that's what caused the surveyor to get himself into deep water. So on the subject of blistering and hole blistering, this one's a little bit easier. Uh, these are large blisters on a hull, which has been painted properly, 
but at least it means that you can see what's going on underneath. So it, you don't really need to remove a lot of paint to say that this hole's got a problem with blistering. Uh, that, that's a fairly uh, a no-brainer. <laughs> no this one here um, was a vessel, it was a, a, quite a new vessel, it was only nine months old, um, and it was suffering from gel blistering. The interesting thing here is that this blistering was concentrated in one area, and there it is. And that is a typical roller mark. That's where somebody in the construction of the vessel used a dirty roller or um, on that particular, got to the end of a mix and continued to roll it into the mold. Um, and so you've got literally one roller's width of blistering in one part of the hull only. Um, unfortunately though, all the paint had to be removed and we had to do gel repairs but they were limited, they could be limited to that area only. And, and this is uh, something you see quite a lot um, on boats where you'll find that there is one particular area of hull blistering. And very often it's starboard aft because people start uh, putting the gel into the hull, normally port side aft, work forward and then work back and then by the time you get to the end of your pot of gel, you've got to the starboard aft area of the hull, and there that's where the gel's starting to go off, and you shouldn't be putting it in the mould, but you're doing it anyway, and it all goes horribly wrong. So this particular boat was starboard forward, so I'm not sure where they started rolling that in, but certainly that was a, a, an issue in laminating up the hull. Another one, wind and water line, another typical area where you'll find it, even though there was no sign of blistering anywhere on the hull, um, other than that, it, it, it was starting at the wind and water line, um, which is again fairly typical. Uh, this is an old blister, so when the paint was removed to have a look at what's underneath, we could see that although the, the hull didn't have any blistering now, um, it did have blistering in the past. Um, which had been opened up and then overpainted. <clears throat> this one here harks back to the earlier um, where we started really, which is a problem with the hull when it was actually uh, laminated up in the first instance. And what it was was that the gel um, had not adhered to the underlying laminate. So the clue was that there was a couple of areas where it had actually broken off and this one in particular and what happened is you could actually get your fingernail under there and you could just pick the gel off the hull so the gel the outer gel was not stuck to the hull in any shape or form anywhere and really it all basically fell off <laughs> well i don't think we need to dwell too much on this one <laughs> This was a wooden boat um, that suffered damage uh, when it was lifted out of the water. The owner of the boat blamed the boatyard for causing the damage to the hull uh, because he said they hadn't lifted it correctly. Uh, and unfortunately, when I went to look at the boat, I'm not sure that it was actually the fault of the hoist. Um, I think there might have been something else going on. <laughs> I could actually push my hand through the hull on this particular boat. <laughs> yeah, so, that, so that's that's sort of just some little hull nightmares that come along. I mean, you know, there's lots of degrees of, of hull issues. I know Paul's watching and smiling in the background. You know, sometimes it's fairly obvious what's going on, and sometimes it's not. Um, and although I don't, uh, uh, I'm not one of these that supports scraping off masses of paint off somebody's nice boat. Um, you obviously do have to have a look and see what's underlying, but if you can't see what's going on underneath the paint, then at least say you can't see what's going on underneath the paint and, and suggest the paint is removed so that further inspections can be carried out. Because if you don't, and then eventually somebody does take the paint off and find out their hull's gone horribly wrong, they're going to come straight back to the surveyor and say, well, why didn't you tell me this? 
or why didn't you advise me about that? Um, and, and, you know, there goes your, um, the, your insurance. So there's some keel issues. Uh, this one, quite self-explanatory really. Obviously there's been some movement in the keel, water's got onto the palms, um, and it's starting to push away the laminate where the keel's been glassed to the hull. Another instance here where you've got a hull to keel joint, uh, which is separated. Somebody's had a little job um, going around this with some Sikaflex to try and solve the problem, um, but it's continued to bleed. Inside, um, the clue was that you can see that this area has been regelled. So they've actually done some uh, work inside to cover up the cracks. Uh, and it's quite obvious that the keel bolts have been replaced and somebody's cut them off with a grinder when they finish putting new bolts in. So the story here is that you know that there has been a major issue with the keel, um, there has been repairs carried out, and the keel has been taken off and replaced. Here's a build keeler. So quite typically grounding damage from um, sitting on a hard bottom and drying out. So repeatedly, uh, the boat had suffered trauma to its bilge keels. Uh, and again, the clue was get inside, have a look and see what's going on. And here we go. So <laughs> yeah, there's the attachments for the same keel, uh, obviously in a poor state of repair. And also somebody's carried out some, uh, well, some unattractive repairs to try and stiffen up the area in way of the keel. Um, I think Paul could probably say, he could probably tell you exactly what boat this is, um, just from what we're looking at there, because we've all seen this before. Now this keel um, was a bit of an issue uh, because it was a case of my boat's been recently damaged uh, in an incident. Well, as you can see, it wasn't that recently damaged in the incident. Uh, because it's taken the time for all these barnacles to grow on the areas where all the gel has been scraped off the bottom of the keel of the boat. The area was quite extensive, um, as you can see in this photograph here, um, all the way along the length of the keel, uh, the gel had been stripped off um, and it had been lying in the water ever since, uh, probably for in excess of 12 months. So whipping through, because I've only got another half hour and we've got a long way to go, um, here's some engine space issues. A nice piece of wiring. See a lot of this. This is where somebody's um, rewired um, his shower sump pump uh, and also there was a bilge pump wired into this as well. Uh, and I'm not sure that that's actually waterproof. Uh, and bearing in mind it's in the bilge, uh, I don't think that that would pass muster somehow. Uh, this uh, set of breakers here has also suffered a little bit of water ingress, um, which came from a leaking deck. Uh, and we'll see that when we get to the deck section later on where the water was actually coming from. But again, uh, a major problem. I mean, the guy I was talking previously was talking about we, somebody was asking about boats that had sunk um, and one of the issues with boats that have been submerged to any degree is that wiring once it's immersed in water tends to soak up the water by capillary action and the, the recommendation certainly my recommendation when boats have suffered partial immersions is that, that what you've got to do is rewire it because you might think that you're going to get away with it, but then later on you'll probably have um, wiring which is going to fail, could even cause a fire in the boat because the water's got in there and corroded the wiring inside. So although you can't see it, once the water's in the wiring, you've got a problem. This one here um, was given to me by uh, my associate, Chris Wilkes. Uh, a very interesting one. It came up a little while ago on my mechanical installations uh, presentation that I did. This is a gear cable uh, on a stern drive. 
<coughs> on, a, on an aluminium rib. Uh, this gear cable actually spontaneously combusted and burst into flames. So, which is a bit of a, a mystery really, one doesn't expect gear cables uh, to catch fire. So, they had to find out why the gear cable was catching fire and the clue is in the next photograph. The gentleman concerned had fitted a new battery isolator uh, in the compartment underneath the helm. Uh, and that is how it was fitted. Uh, he didn't actually mount it, he just fitted a battery isolator and left it inside the hull. So the battery isolator was actually um, earthing itself to the hull, or it was certainly applying live current to the hull, and then the earth came back through the gearbox, uh, through the gear cable, uh, and that's what caused the gear cable to spontaneously combust, because when he tried to start the engine, uh, and current was drawn, all the current was flowing through the gear cable to try and complete the circuit. <laughs> so quite an interesting one, uh, but in the process, um, bearing in mind this was an aluminium vessel, um, although the photograph's not very clear, you can see that it also um, was causing a serious problem on the hull. So not only was uh, uh, the wiring all suffering um, also, the hull was suffering as well. And all down to the fact that he hadn't fitted his battery isolator and mounted it correctly. Uh, here's uh, one which you've probably all seen. Uh, the first time I saw it many years ago now, um, I must admit, I was a bit confused why Volvo Penta would give their engines a 10-year useful lifespan. Um, which, if you're buying a large motorboat um, with a large Volvo Penta engine in it, uh, means that every 10 years you're going to have to spend the best part of £60,000 um, on engines and, and also the additional cost of having them removed and replaced. Uh, I think the argument was that they said that basically they had to give an engine a useful life um, of a thousand hours. Well, a thousand hours. Yeah, and certainly in years ago when I was an engineer, um, that would be uh, the first major service, uh, not the end of the engine. So, but some interesting, another interesting point on this particular engine plate is that this engine is a recreational engine and uh, is not to be installed on, and it will be out of guarantee if it's used on a commercial vessel. Um, I'm not sure whether Volvo actually told people that before they fitted it in their, um, in their harbour launch. That engine is the D4, um, and I've covered D4s before, and here is the classic D4, where the, um, the cooler end cover um, is starting to bleed salt. Um, this was a problem, um, D4s had other problems when they were first developed with their cooling systems. Um, because they decided to put the strainer after um, the water pump rather than before the water pump, which put the strainer under water pump pressure, uh, which blew the tops off the strainer boxes and, and caused a few engine failures. Volvo solved that one, but um, this is another cooling system problem which they had on the D4, where the, the end covers and this particular um, gasket um, plate in between the end cover and the uh, and the tube stack itself was made of a different material so you ended up with three different materials with three different expansion rates which meant that when the engine gets hot the, the um, tube stack started to bleed uh, and once this started um, the um, o seals inside uh, were letting water past the corrosion set in and then forevermore your end covers would bleed. Um, there was a, 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 a maintenance um, a, a reminder put out to Volvo dealers um, that at, at, at their first major service interval, they need to remove these end covers and replace um, the gasket plates with a different material plate. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of these did slip through uh, and it was a bit of a trap for, for the surveyor 
because the solution is that you clean off the salt deposits before the surveyor comes and looks at your mechanical installation. He doesn't see anything wrong, said everything's fine. Then the guy buys the boat and later on he finds out he's got a problem. Uh, and the solution to the problem is about £10,000 worth of work. Um, and then he goes back to the surveyor, why didn't you tell me? Uh, and the reason is you wouldn't have seen it unless you actually put your head in there while the engine was really hot, um, probably on sea trials or immediately after sea trials. Um, so you need to go back after sea trials to make sure these end coolers aren't leaking. A lot of them have been fixed by now, uh, but the uh, problems didn't end there because now it's been found that these, these coolers, and I had this only a week or so ago, conversation with um, somebody who had a D4 engine, and I said, have you had your end cooler, your coolers done on the boat? And he said, no. And I said, well, you need to get them done as soon as possible because the boat's over five years old and they need to be done. Uh, he eventually found all his gearbox oil in the bilge um, and his gearbox uh, cooler had actually failed um, and dumped his gearbox oil into the bilge, whereupon he got his coolers done. And fortunately for him, uh, the corrosion inside wasn't too bad. And his Volvo agent said, well, you really need to get these done every 10 years. Well, he hadn't actually made his 10 years. My understanding is every five years. Um, but again, that's the difference between Volvo agents. Some say one thing, some say something else. This one here, uh, this is actually an exhaust system on a boat. Uh, the gentleman who owned the boat um, had uh, changed his engine. Uh, the diameter of the exhaust was different to the one that was fitted to the boat. As you can see, it's much smaller diameter. So the solution was, oh, that's okay. We'll just stick one pipe inside the other and seal it up with Sikaflex. <laughs> uh, not sure that that's actually um, a decent repair. This one here is one for the engineers. Um, this was uh, an insurance claim uh, that was made um, following uh, a, a complete overhaul um, of an engine in a stern drive in a boat where the, had the engine had been recently um, stripped and, and overhauled and rebuilt. Uh, he put it in the boat, took his boat out and, and he said to me, he said, oh, the engine seemed a bit tight. Um, needless to say, it lasted 30 minutes. Uh, before the engine seized, uh, whereupon uh, he wasn't very happy with the people who had just overhauled his engines um, and he decided that he was going to make a claim against them. Uh, they said that the reason for the failure was that it was the cooling water system that had failed uh, because he hadn't instructed them to overhaul the seawater pump uh, when they stripped and rebuilt the engine. Um, so I, I went down and I, I looked at this and I thought, well, that isn't an engine overheat problem. This is a, a lubrication issue. Um, so, uh, I mean, the oil could be as hot as you like, but it would still be actually lubricating the bearings. So the bearings failed for another reason. Uh, uh, at the time, they showed me the, uh, the, the bearing shells. Um, but they only showed me the bearing shells on the right. Uh, that's these two here. Um, and I thought, well, they don't look too bad. Um, I don't see what's wrong here. Um, so I went away and I got in the car and I was going to leave. And I thought, well, hang on a minute. Where's the other shells? So I went back and I said, um, where's the rest of the bearing shells? Oh. So then the bucket came out where the other bits and pieces were and the two bearing shells on the left came out. And that's when the penny dropped. Because if you can see that there are little tags on the bearing shells which locate them uh, in the big ends. Um, and the one on the right here clearly shows the tag. The one on the left here shows the tag, but the tag has been compressed. And what had happened was when they would rebuilt the engine, they hadn't fitted the shell in the right way round. So when they, when they <coughs> tensioned up the big end bolts, what they did was they squeezed the bearing shell onto the journal 
Um, so actually it was metal to metal contact, which is why it only lasted 30 minutes. So I took the engineer to one side and I said, look, pal, we've all done this. We've all made mistakes. You know, you just put the shells in the wrong way around. I said, what you need to do now is to tell the gentleman that you will repair his engine uh, and you'll do it free of charge uh, because, you know, you may have made a mistake um, and, and just leave it at that. Save your reputation because, you know, you've lost this one, pal. <laughs> So, and there's uh, another picture there of the compressed shell. Now we're going to get on to uh, something that uh, I've had a little bit of a ramble on this year. Uh, I'm not an inland waterways surveyor, uh, and I, don't, I admit as such, I'm a seagoing person myself. Um, however, um, getting involved in the inland waterways uh, and the condition that some of these boats are in, uh, and the way that some of these boats operate has caused me no end of concern. Now, just looking at that picture, I'm not sure how many of you out there uh, might see what my concerns are, but I think stability is, is my big concern here. Uh, it became apparent to me that a typical narrow boat, being narrow boat by its um, definition, um, has quite a, a low center of gravity um, and it's metacentric height uh, and its rising lever is quite low um, and so really they're not the most stable vessels in the world. To make them stable I understand that people tend to fill the bilges um, with paving slabs uh, and, and other items to to, to give them a better center of gravity and make them more stable. This, of course, makes the surveyor's job incredibly difficult because it's okay trying to lift up somebody's floors, which are normally all screwed down anyway, but when you lift the floors up, all you can see is some block paving um, and you can't actually see the inside of the hull. So here's some more examples of these wonderful vessels operating um, in a stable mode. Uh, and I, it, it worries me to death, to be honest, that, that people, but I suppose if you haven't got a garden, you just put it on the roof. Uh, Mike here, Jeff. Uh, Graham's got the answer to the whole problem. Uh, he <laughs> says it'll have enough beer and wine on board to offset the flower boxes, so you don't need to worry. <laughs> yeah, well, they're certainly going to need something. Yeah. Uh, Hopefully they stay in that lovely calm water, which is only about three feet deep, and that way they won't come to too much harm. But as you know, as we've been discussing, Mike, um, there are different categories for inland waterways, and, different, and these categories are applied to different craft, which are suitable for certain areas. The, the problem is, is the people that operate these boats don't know what those areas are, and they don't know what the categories are. Uh, and they venture out, and, and a vessel very similar to one of these ventured out onto the tidal Thames and rolled over, <coughs> which generated um, a, a, a lot of issues with the MCA and the Inland Waterways authorities, um, and they have brought out a, a set of standards now, uh, but it's the application of those standards which is in question, um, which is something that we're going to be addressing within the next few months. Uh, here's an inland waterways craft um, that unfortunately did sink um, and I was called in by insurers to go and find out why it sank um, and I think even just looking at that photograph it's quite apparent that there's something untoward been going on. The, the pipes, the red pipes there that are disappearing, are disappearing underneath a large lump of concrete which had been poured into the bilge between the cooker on the left here and the bathroom on the right um, and this was right in the middle of the boat uh, and this area was very badly corroded internally. The surveyor who did the survey on this boat couldn't get access to underneath the boat and this is a problem which has come up again and again 
uh, on uh, insurance claims against inland waterways craft surveyors is that they don't get proper access underneath the boat to inspect the outer bottom, um, in which case they need to say so. Um, this particular boat um, was surveyed and he said that the plate work on the outer bottom when it was tested ultrasonically was found to be um, a minimum of three millimeters thick. And in fact, the boat was made from three millimeter plate in the first place. So uh, uh, it didn't have much to lose before it got dangerously thin. So this area here shows where the scale on the inside, I brushed it to one side, took some ultrasonic readings, which is the patches of gel that you can see. And quite right, those um, areas of ultrasonic readings showed that the outer bottom was in, in those areas uh, 2.8 millimeters thick, which on an original three millimeter thick plate is not too bad at all. Unfortunately, between those two spots, you can see the hole in the bottom, which just goes to prove the point that you can take as many ultrasonic readings as you like, um, but there's no guarantee that where you're taking the reading um, uh, is that there isn't any, of, uh, any other problems in areas where you're not taking a reading. So get the old hammer out and do some hammer testing. But above all, if you can't inspect the outside of the hull, at least take the effort to inspect the inside of the hull. Uh, uh, because if you don't, then the danger is, as with this one, it was taken uh, by truck from, the, from where it was surveyed and it was taken across the country and put in a canal and it sank within 10 minutes, um, having had a recent survey. So. Right, propulsion. Uh, here's another nightmare. <clears throat> this is a bow thruster tube, which uh, somebody had obviously decided to fit their own bow thruster. So the material, the, the, the tube itself is perfectly good, uh, a nice piece of GRP laminate. Um, and he stuck it through a hole in the hull and then obviously went down to his local uh, motorist center, car repair shop, bought himself some isopon uh, and then stuck the tube to the hull with some isopon. Uh, not quite the quality of an installation that one would like to see. Uh, there's another shot of it. Um, amazingly, uh, it leaked a bit, but it, it was actually intact. Um, but uh, as I say, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't guarantee that installation. <coughs> this one here uh, is, is an interesting one because this is actually a problem which is common to this particular stern drive. This is a Mercruiser stern drive. Uh, and unfortunately, a very good shot that, that Chris had taken here um, because to get your camera in behind the engine uh, where the tiller goes through the transom is difficult on a good day uh, but these are really good shots of what's actually going on now you can see the tiller arm going through the transom and what's going on inside and they suffered very badly from corrosion um, and Mercury's around drives you need to be really, really careful about this, uh, checking uh, the, the tiller attachments inside the transom. Well, and access, as you can see here, to get in there and actually see what's going on. You can, you can see even in this shot um, that there's, everything looks perfectly okay outside, but as soon as you manage to get inside, you can find that everything is um, very much corroded away. And there's another shot of the same thing. This one here um, was a survey that I did uh, on a boat that had been uh, recently taken out of the water. Uh, and the owner of the boat um, was particularly perturbed when it was taken out of the water because water was pouring out of the bottom of the rudder. Uh, and, and he got himself into a bit of a flap. And I said, well, this happens to be a maxi. Uh, and it, for those of you that don't know, maxi took the unusual um, decision to drill a hole in the bottom of their rudders to allow them to drain. So, they, they, so the rudder was full of water 
and when it was lifted out the water all the water ran out the hole at the bottom uh, and that's quite usual for a maxi so you, you know people say to me oh my rudder is wet um, and, I, and I always say to them well well it would be wouldn't it because it's been in the water and, and rudders don't there is the, the there is nowhere for the moisture to go if it goes if it's a hollow rudder the, the moisture will pass through the the outer laminate and it'll end up inside and it's got nowhere else to go so the readings will always be higher also of course you don't know what's inside uh, the laminate of a rudder um, it can be plywood um, it can be uh, foam uh, either one of those materials will have a higher moisture content than the rest of the hull. So one would always expect rudders to be a little bit higher. Uh, and moisture, as you know, isn't an indication of a defect in itself. It just means that it is high in moisture. And the defect is when it all starts to, uh, to go horribly wrong. So in, still on, on stern drives and shafts and things, um, the issue here is the project, projection of the propeller uh, away from the P-bracket. This uh, issue uh, raised quite a lot due to the fact that manufacturers change um, their engine installations um, to make more space inside and they fit V-drives, uh, whereas before they, they didn't. Um, so before the engine was in the middle of the boat um, and everything was hunky-dory, uh, and then they decided to make some extra space inside, put a V-drive in there, shift the engine to the back, uh, and then everything starts to go horribly wrong because it's the same hull, but now it's got a completely different mechanical installation. But the issue there is in order to give lift, they, norm, they have to uh, in, increase uh, the, the, the lift aft. To increase the lift aft, they fare in above the propeller so that there, um, there's a scoop effect which lifts the back end of the boat. In doing that, it decreases the tip clearance between the propeller and the hull. The solution to that is, is to shift the propeller further away from the hull, which means that it then projects further away from the P-bracket. And basically, you're just chasing your ass here. Um, you're just going ever downward uh, and the projections get uh, bigger and bigger. Uh, this one, in rule of thumb, it would be one times the diameter of the shaft. Um, you certainly wouldn't want to see more than one and a half times the diameter of the shaft. And this one was almost three times the diameter of the shaft. However, that in itself doesn't mean to say that it's completely wrong. Um, because the, the wear on the cutlass bearing is one issue, vibration is another but then you've got your clearances to take into account. You've got clearances between the propeller and the rudder. You've got clearances between the tip of the blade and the hull. And all these clearances should be within tolerance. And sometimes to achieve that, you just have to shift the prop out. This one here, um, well, that's really been shifted out. Uh, and this is a, a, a Nimbus, uh, which is where they have actually changed the, uh, the, the, the propulsion system. And as you can see, that projection is, I would say, excessive. <clears throat> this one here, um, a lovely lady, um, quite, a, quite an elderly lady, but she sails her boat. Um, and, and it was a Victoria 26, um, this particular sailing boat. And, and she'd done many, many thousands of miles in this uh, and was continuing to do so. Uh, unfortunately, in the process, um, all their lockers were full of kit. Um, so I couldn't get in through the LAS. When I did get in through the LAS, having emptied it, uh, which took the best part of half an hour to empty the LAS, I got in there and I found that I couldn't get in behind the engine. So I then went into the quarter berth on the other side and I had a look and sure enough, I couldn't get into behind the engine from the other side either. So I said to her, I said, well, you know, who maintains your boat? Oh, well, I've got a very well, um, a, a very friendly engineer chap who, who does all my engineering for me and he looks after the boat. Um, so he does all of that. Um, so eventually I managed to get over the top of the engine, or at least I managed to get my hand over the top of the engine 
and take a photograph of the back of the engine and that's what I saw. Uh, and in the photograph obviously you can see that things are not quite as they should be um, and also uh, you might notice that the gearbox casing is also cracked. Um, so his well-meaning, her well-meaning engineer wasn't really doing her much of a service really because obviously he hadn't been in there for a very long time. Now here's a clue. Um, this particular boat um, had had a problem in the past uh, and that problem had led to the shaft being changed. I mean the clue here obviously is you can see that one half of the coupling has been painted and one half isn't painted and there are marks on it where somebody's been doing some alignments. Um, so the issue with this is well what's happened to the boat and um, when we started to look further we found out that the boat had actually had a grounding um, and they'd have to replace, they had replaced the propellers and the shaft uh, and unfortunately not the engine mounts um, which also needed to be done. But that was a bit of a clue as to that there was something wrong. I mean other clues are a bit more obvious which we'll come to in a minute. This particular vessel um, I'm ashamed to say it was a commercial vessel or it was in commercial service anyway and it was being used um, for um, training courses um, uh, as a, for uh, RYA yacht masters um, on power uh, and this um, showed a bit of a lack of, of maintenance um, looking a bit further up the shaft uh, the coupling also uh, wasn't quite in the full flush of youth um, and um, actually neither was the gearbox um, uh, and that, that was a gearbox on a vessel that was actually in use for training purposes would you believe um, and the mountings were, were they they've been suffering from a bit of lack of maintenance as well uh, the whole boat was a disaster really um, and I think it led to uh, um, certainly the coding surveyor was struck off um, unfortunately another surveyor came in from the same um, institute not our institute thank god um, and he recoded it uh, and unfortunately it was a member of this institute our institute the IMS who eventually went to uh, inspect the boat um, had it, has it had come up for sale as a coded vessel and when he saw this he sent me the photograph said surely not surely not uh, and uh, yeah so uh, this caused a little bit of a, uh, an investigation into standards of coding practice another shaft projection um, this has allowed um, the guy to actually fit some additional bits of kit on the exposed bit of shaft and this one here, well, we'll put a nylon collar in there, that'll help. So, uh, and a rope cutter. So, but how his cutlass bearing is going to get any cooling water, God only knows. But you can see even there that the tip clearances are still pretty tight. Um, it, it's all down to uh, changing uh, the specifications of a boat without actually uh, changing the, the, the layout of the hull and the shaft alignments. This one, uh, a bit of a shaft alignment issue on this one. Uh, I think we, we can safely say that that's obviously had a little bit of a grounding incident. Uh, this one a bit more so. Um, uh, this this was an interest. This was a 75 foot fair line, um, which I uh, I was actually looking at another boat, uh, which was an 85 foot princess that unfortunately had found part of Sardinia. Um, in the middle of the night at 20 knots on autopilot um, and ended up um, clear of the water on the rocks um, which meant that it had to have some very serious surgery um, to get it put back to rights uh, and after I'd been inside in, inspecting the repairs that were being carried out to the Princess 85 I walked outside and there was this Fairline 75 that had also suffered a little bit of a grounding incident. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this uh, particular uh, vessel was a, a very large, very well known and unnamed uh, mega yacht um, on its maiden voyage uh, that uh, found itself um, getting a little bit too close to a gravel bank. 
uh, th this one, yeah, um, well, yeah, that, that was was bit, bit something a bit harder than a gravel bank. It looks rather like somebody's gone at it uh, and actually chewed <laughs> the blades off it. But yeah, another little bit of a grounding incident with that one. Do love some of these shots. All right, well, I'm, I'm getting a bit tight on time, but interesting that here is, uh, whether you can see clearly or not, this, these are two stern drives on the same boat on the same day. Uh, the one on the left, you can see that there is a gap between the duo props. The one on the right, there is no gap between the duo props. Um, so this was the port side, the one on the right. Uh, and this um, actually had caused the engine to slow because the, the propellers were actually wearing on each other uh, and it was affecting the performance. Um, and it also caused some noise, which they noticed on the way to the hoist. And I said, well, I'm not surprised you noticed some noise on the way to the hoist. So their, their propellers were actually grinding together on the way to the hoist due to the fact that the, the bushes had failed inside. Same stern drive. <coughs> same boat um, and I, I also advise that um, when they're getting their stern drive sorted out perhaps they ought to leave uh, a little bit of uh, a clearance around the stern drive uh, between the anti-foul and the stern drive itself. A one inch clearance is something we like to see uh, to stop any electrolytic actions going. Oh my favourite, shaft anodes. All right. Um, most of the brokers around my area uh, are aware of my pet hate with shaft anodes uh, on motorboats. I don't mind a shaft anode on a sailing boat because at the end of the day it's only going to do six knots and the shaft doesn't revolve that quickly anyway. Um, but on a high speed motorboat I don't like to see shaft anodes. Uh, especially the wrong sort of shaft anode which it clearly is. Um, where this one is the bolt is actually through the anode itself not through a metal strap which is connected to the shaft so now this has eaten itself away it's now moving on the shaft and and here's another couple this one here you can see the slide marks where the anode has been traveling up and down the shaft as the boat's been going ahead in the stern and the same with the one on the right um, where they eventually end up blocking the water path through to the cutlass bearing and they write the cutlass bearings off. So shaft anodes, a bit of a pet hate for me. Uh, this one here, well, you can quite clearly see that that one's already gone. So. Here's an interesting uh, little scenario here. This was another insurance claim where a newly fitted um, sail drive in a, in a, a sailing boat <coughs> and failed uh, and it failed within um, uh, within a couple of months uh, it did last a couple of months so to be fair it did last that long uh, and uh, the the bolts had sheared uh, and I spoke to the repairer about this and and he was oh well it's nothing to do with me um, it was all done correctly all assembled correctly so I checked and, and yes, um, the sail drive um, kit comes with two sets of bolts. One set of bolts is for mounting and one set of bolts is for coupling. Unfortunately, when they put the sail drive and connected it to the engine, they use the mounting bolts on the coupling and they use the coupling bolts on the mounting, which meant that the, the bolts that they'd fitted literally had only about three threads showing where they were connecting the drive to the engine, which led to the shearing of the bolts and the failure of the drive. Decks, well, this is the one I mentioned earlier where we had the water running down the electricals. Um, so this deck repair, um, I thought was a little bit low par, to be honest. Um, and and there, there was evidence of leaks inside. And you can see that they actually had lifted the deck at some stage, um, put something down, uh, it looks like plywood or whatever, and they glued it to the deck and then they put the teak back over the top, um, but it uh, hadn't lasted very well. Teak decks are a bit of a problem. <coughs> they do wear, 
Um, some are mechanically fixed as these are, uh, and, and you can see here where the dowels have gone and then we, we're starting to get deck leaks. And this one isn't too badly worn. This one, now you're starting to see all the fixing showing through and this one's starting to wear away. Unfortunately, this particular teak decking is quite thin. And so I, it, there was no hope of actually recovering this uh, uh, and maintaining it as it was. Um, it, this was gonna be a renewal job. Um, and again, we've got the same issues with there. This was a super yacht that I did only a few weeks ago. Um, and this particular boat, um, 120 feet, got an awful lot of teak. Uh, got three decks of teak, in fact, and the whole lot was very badly worn. Uh, and the cost to replace all of that lot was going to be a, a small fortune and maybe a deciding factor in the purchase of the boat. Another clue to worn teak decks, so you've got a nice dowel standing up there. And of course, the corking is standing proud as well. <coughs> this one here, a bit of a decking giveaway, this one. Uh, this was the commercial the operated vessel with the rusty gearbox and the rusty shafts um, and the maintenance on this boat was pretty poor um, and this was the solution to removing a deck filler uh, which left a hole in the deck so the solution to that was stick a bit of treadmaster over it it'll be fine uh, and needless to say it wasn't Seacocks, uh, we're gonna to have to get our skates on now because otherwise Mike's gonna be shouting at me. Um, here's some seacocks for you. We've all been there before. Seacocks come in various standards. Uh, most of them are, um, that are being fitted these days because they, they are the way they are supplied by some manufacturers. I can't for the life of me say the name of the persons that might be marketing these things. But when they put them in their blister pack, you'll find that the standard of the seacock is on the side that you can't see through the clear plastic. And it isn't until you've paid for this seacock and taken it out of the packet, you find out it's made in Italy and it's actually a hydraulic quality in, uh, valve and it's not suitable for use on uh, underwater. Uh, and this is what happens to them. And we've all seen these before, haven't we? The handles normally go first because they're made of steel. But here you've got so many different metals going on um, and, and so many different reactions going on. Um, and, and they're all in a bit of a nightmare, really. Uh, this one very recently I did. Um, and again, it's, it's the wrong grade of seacock. Uh, I didn't really want to put too much pressure on this because I didn't think that it was going to last much longer. They, they do get through and, and manufacturers do fit them as standard. Um, because they satisfy the requirements of the RCD and, and consumer advice in as much as they will probably last five to six years. And if they last five years, then they satisfy the requirements. Um, what they don't say is that if you buy one of their boats, once it's five years old, you need to change all your seacocks. And when you change them, put something decent in there. <coughs> There's uh, another fizzing away seacock, although at least it is bonded. That's something. Here's a clue to uh, where you've had issues with seacocks in the past. Is oh no, no, there's nothing wrong here. Uh, well, how come you've got a tide line in your bilge? Um, so obviously there's been water in there before uh, where you've had issues with uh, leaky seacocks. Access. Another one of my pet hates, this particular boat. Um, lovely engine, look at that, isn't that? That's a joy to behold, isn't it? Look, you've got lovely, you know, air extraction and supply systems in there and everything else. Um, unfortunately, that is the only access to the engine. I thought that perhaps this panel on the right here was removable, but I was wrong. Uh, that is it. So that's the engine installed in the boat. Um, God help anyone who's ever got to do any maintenance on that. Uh, couldn't even get to the oil filter. Same boat, because it's a lovely boat. It's, you know, this is, we're talking millions of pounds worth of boat here. Um, and they also fitted a generator in the, in the 
the aft cabin uh, and there's the generator as it is installed uh, and I'd removed some panels to try and get to it and then failed miserably uh, because that's as far as I could go with the stripping out uh, and there is the generator it's in there it's lovely uh, all very nicely installed uh, you're not going to get that acoustic cover off I can assure you of that and that's the distance between the acoustic cover and, and the welded aluminium frames that are in containing it you just can't believe that people are still building things like this and, and paying that sort of money for it. Observations. <coughs> uh, oh dear, we're back to that boat again, aren't we? Yeah. Anyway, let's leave that for a minute. Observation, insulation, engine compartment insulation. That's not going to pass muster. What's missing? Oh, yeah, shouldn't there be a bathing ladder in there? Yeah, that was a bit of a surprise for the uh, for the guy when I said, oh, well, where's your ladder gone? What ladder? I said, the one that's supposed to be in here. <laughs> uh, 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 how to retain your anchor so you can let it go in an emergency. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, okay, yeah, oh, well, okay. Well, that repair's not going to pass muster, mate. You know, no, that's where the deck's cracked on the, uh, on the cable locker surround. Um, and he did a... Well, he made an attempt to repair it, but it failed. Uh, just general observations here. I think the seals on this fridge freezer have failed as well. <laughs> this one here um, is in their fuel oil pipes. Um, they weren't 7840 grade, needless to say. Um, and this is the diesel starting to leak out of them. Um, this was immediately before sea trial and I abandoned the trial. And they said, why? So I'm not going to see in that. <laughs> Here's another pet hay, one that's coming up. Uh, and I believe we've had a lecture on this one, heater installations. Another one of my pet hates at the moment, um, especially due to some recent fatalities. Uh, and this is the air supply going into the heater, um, which is within the compartment that the heater is installed in. There's no trunking, there's no fresh air from outside, no nothing. Um, and and this is a bit of a problem, uh, and it's a problem uh, which we we are going to be talking more about in the future. I think uh, due to these uh, fatalities, uh, I've checked on the the rules and regulations for this, and they they are supposed to have an air supply from atmosphere. Uh, and the the question to you guys out there is, how many times do you see one? With an air supply trunk from atmosphere you know because the danger is that they could be sucking in anything uh, and the one in question was sucking in its own exhaust leak so the actual heater was breathing its own exhaust and and pumping it into the accommodation in ever increasing uh, <clears throat> amounts until eventually it killed the occupants this heater was in our oh that's our commercially operated vessel again uh, and there's a heater installation and i'm not sure that that one's gonna uh, pass muster to be honest uh, and just to finish off <coughs> here was a vessel um, uh, which i hope i never get asked to survey uh, and i was very distressed to find out from the, the guy that owns the marina that somebody was living on that boat up until a couple of weeks previously um, and worse than that, that the guy who was living on the boat and that that boat was being paid for as accommodation by the local council. Oh my God. Seriously. They've now moved him into sheltered accommodation. But yeah, that was his council accommodation. Which just goes to show the, the job we've got to do. Is there any mould on that boat there, Jeff? <laughs> I, think, I think there's more things living on that boat than, than the old guy that was living on it, to be honest. Dear, oh dear. Jeff, brilliant. Uh, great way to end the day. I don't know if anyone's got any, any points or questions they want to raise, but... No, thank you for sharing your photo album. <laughs> and, uh, no, 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 and thank you. And, and I must say, actually, I think I think we all, especially those who have been um, sat 
uh, watching all these uh, events during the day today, uh, and some of whom will maybe watch some of the events tomorrow, we owe a huge debt of thanks to you and your team um, mm -hmm. for putting all this together. I mean, this is the third year now. Um, and I mean, obviously this year you had your own problems because you've all been suffering from COVID uh, and some of you have, haven't fully recovered even now. And, and I just would like to thank you all uh, for all your hard work. That's kind of you, Jeff. Thank you very much. And, and thank you. Uh, thank you to our other 11 presenters today. Uh, big thank you to everybody for being with us and to those of you who watch this online. You know, uh, we'll send the videos around. Um, then, you know, I, I hope you'll enjoy what, uh, what we put out for you. A lot of the content today is completely fresh. Um, this has not been seen anywhere before. So, you know, it's great to be able to bring original content. And uh, I think that's what the Institute's um, very good at doing. Uh, lots of fan mail coming in, Jeff. So you, you've, you've done a great job. <laughs> uh, well, it was, it was a little bit of light-hearted humour to end the day, really. Just, just to show some nightmares, you know, of things that, you, that come along. But uh, well, I, I, have to, I have to say to you that um, when we, we did this, or I didn't do it, but um, Lloyd Griffin III, wonderful name out in the States, delivered this presentation with the same type of theme. The images in the States are just, just as bad, in fact, if not worse. So it is a shit not, not unique to a UK surveyor, uh, but everybody who's online, you know, we know that. So, so thank you very much indeed.